I thought I'd take this opportunity to revisit um, issues related to calibration, estimation, um, and verification or testing of uh, stochastic equilibrium models, and then to um, shift, and then to go on and discuss challenges going forward. Uh, in contrast to yesterday, a little bit more from an econometric perspective. Um, much criticism has been uh, lodged towards what I think of as the initial stochastic equilibrium models. And uh, these are ones that um, their motivation um, was to kind of combine microeconomics and macroeconomics in the construction. Uh, it's, uh, they had inputs tracing back to Modigliani and Friedman's work on, on consumption, uh, work on stochastic growth models, uh, Brock Meerman, Lucas Prescott, Kidlin Prescott analyses. And there's been a, and there's a parallel development in finance of the intertemporal asset pricing models, uh, list, you know, by Merton, Breeden, Lucas, Cox and Grissau, and Ross and others. Uh, the, the, the um, calibration portions of these models, uh, especially on the macroeconomic side of this, uh, really look towards two data sources. So in order to pick parameter values, the, you know, the idea is, I, is that we look at long-run steady-state relations fit to, say, means or growth rates. And the idea is that these would be robust to things like transient dynamics. Of course, at the end of the day, this only provides limited identification. And uh, given its links to steady states was, in some sense, uh, premised on small shock approximation. Um, now, one of the virtues of starting from microeconomic foundations was, was the potential to reach out to, micro, uh, to microeconomic evidence. And this was certainly argued from the outset as one of the great virtues, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as, as, um, I, I, as we proceed. And discussions of this kind of calibration and critiques of it as well, um, you know, descriptions of it are in Cooley and Prescott and Kidlin and Prescott. There was a Journal of Economic Perspectives uh, symposium in which, in which uh, Kidlin, Prescott, Sims, and Heckman and I contributed, uh, you know, well over a decade ago. Um, and, and discussing both, you know, you know, the virtues and limits of this whole line of research. Um, now, the verification from the macro side of this really, uh, the models were so stylized as to be easily rejected with rich enough time series data. And this was pretty much obvious. Um, these were models with single shock, that, so it was focused on the so called technology shock model and in very limited transient dynamics. And so you're not going to explain multiple time series and, uh, 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 very easily with such a limited set of um, inputs. <clears throat> The responses to this was, well, at the end of the day, models are approximations, and so they're, therefore we'll, we'll use very, what I would think of as very weak empirical targets in order to uh, uh, not lead to immediate dismissal of them. Um, moreover, many prominent, some prominent macroeconomists argued that the implied asset pricing anomalies that went along with these models uh, uh, was kind of a separate concern. So these models, although they were primarily aimed at the, uh, at the at the macroeconomic side of things, given the, you know, the linkages to the intertemporal asset pricing models, they did have asset pricing implications. Uh, they, so this led to anomalies of the so-called equity premium puzzle, the risk-free rate puzzle, a variety of other ones. And so the idea was, well, maybe separate models should be due to, you know, maybe separate concerns to, should, should um, or uh, drive building of models to confront asset pricing, and that we can think about macroeconomics uh, without getting too lost in that. So I would say these models really had modest ambition. And, so, and, you know, lots of people point out, well, you know, they weren't well suited to talk about monetary policy. That's almost by design here. There's a single technology shock. Early, early on, this was meant to be a story about prey to optimal fluctuations. Uh, that pretty much got abandoned quite a while ago. Uh, this the so-called technology shock quickly became a mongrel, a mongrel of objects that, that, was, um, in, uh, that, that could be potentially influenced by uh, macroeconomic policy. And... Um, and there was substantial discussion about the measurement of this object as a, as, as a pure technology shock versus something else. So yes, this is the one which has, I guess, big, been the biggest punching bag. But in some sense, it's, it's, it's important to remember that, at least from my vantage point, it, it, it had pretty much modest ambitions from the outset. So there's this, as I pointed out, there's this, uh, the same set of theoretical tools we use to kind of build asset pricing models. Um, there's kind of a parallel concern from asset pricing literature that these macro models were not well suited to confront financial market data. 
And yeah, this is in part reinforced by the same empirical evidence which, uh, uh, which I discussed. Um, and there are multiple responses to this uh, in the empirical literature. One is to kind of explore much weaker implications, such as arbitrage implications and, 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 and factor models. An example, the so-called arbitrage pricing model of Ross and others. Another strategy um, was to flexibly parameterize so-called risk-neutral transformations. And as Marcus Brunemeyer talked about yesterday, if we think about asset pricing, there are these channels, these cash flow channels, and there's the um, stochastic discount factor channels. A lot of the economics gets thrown into the stochastic discount factor channel, and that, and, and that was pretty much parameterized away here. So a lot, the, uh, the interesting economics, at least, from, uh, at least from my standpoint, was pretty, get, gets lost quickly in this. Um, now, as a response to empirical evidence, there is lots of in, uh, evidence that uncertainty, uh, that, I'm sorry, that risk premium would fluctuate over, um, over the business cycle in interesting ways. That, that, that risk premium would, would get larger in bad times than good times. And so, you know, models of, uh, of uh, Campbell and Cochran, Santos, Veronese, and others were all about directly trying to get risk prices that had this type of, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 this type of impact. And finally, per perhaps the ones that are most interesting from the standpoint of macroeconomics was their models that explored channels for which investor beliefs about subtle components of long-term macroeconomic growth could be important. These are the so-called long-run risk models. What would it take for, for kind of s potentially subtle pieces of, the, of macro growth to be, have a big impact on what might happen in, in asset pricing? So anyway, these are largely two separate literatures, uh, at least in the early goings. More recently from the macroeconomic side, there's been a formal econometrics literature, much, uh, uh, much more formal than the initial calibration literature, that integrates a variety of transient dynamics, proliferates shocks, and attempt to actually confront time series uh, evidence in a systematic way. The models include both Friedman-style consumption functions, Keynesian-style inertia and prices and wages. They have been used for policy analysis by central banks, and they've also been used to do things like assess fiscal stimulus and the like. So in some sense, they are rich enough to address uh, 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 a wider array of macroeconomic questions, and they're certainly more ambitious in terms of their fitting of at least the transient macroeconomic dynamics in the data. Now, once we put this array of shocks in here, and, it's, and to me it's almost a dizzying array, there's, a, there's some potentially... Um, there's uh, some potentially interesting economics thrown into these shocks because these shocks may well be masking distortions that are, le that are left out of the models. There, there are those multiple sources of transient dynamics. These are at best thought of as kind of shortcuts for more interpretable and interesting models. You know, what I have in mind here is the transient dynamics include second order adjustment costs and investment, uh, local complement intertemporal complementarities and preferences, convenient uh, models of pricing frictions and the like. So there, there may be a first step towards something more interesting, but there's, uh, I think you know, there, there's no doubt that this is, uh, um, there's more economics to be done to make these models interesting. Also, there's an identification problem um, that I think is, is, uh, sh that is evident here. That is, once you have all these... Uh, uh, a bunch of hidden shocks in these trans, uh, and, and, these so -called, and the mechanisms that go, lo go along with them, one can easily imagine there's going to be many possible equivalent ways to explain the data. And this is hit up, hitting upon one of the potential variety of ways in which one could proceed. So earlier work of um, Liu and Sims and others had challenged identification of, uh, of old style macroeconomic models. There's presumably a similar conversation to be had within these. Um, and finally, these models, at least to my taste, were not yet really designed to confront microeconomics in a serious way, microeconometric uh, micro evidence in a serious way. So if we really view this, the reasons we want micro foundations is to confront micro evidence, then it's, I think, that, um, uh, more, just kind of more has to be done here. So what are the challenges for incorporating microeconomic evidence? So kind of look-alike conditions um, under which you go to micro evidence, pick out parameters, and plug them into macro models are often very stringent and, and, and in many cases aren't even particularly useful. Um, versions of the, you know, if you look at labor supply elasticities, it was, I, it, it was figured out early on that the micro labor supply elasticities couldn't just be simply transported into the macro models and that one had to think about uh, uh, um, alternative notions related to aggregation which in order to fit these models together. 
Moreover, market structure now becomes featured in order to really, I think, to confront the microeconomic evidence. In effect, cross-sectional distributions of uh, uh, endogenously determined that evolve over time in response to macroeconomic shocks become state variables, things like the wealth distribution of the uh, uh, underlying um, agents in the economy or, 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 say, other endogenously determined distributions. In addition, there's been a variety of theoretical results that give equilibrium characterizations of things like asset pricing that show up in the stochastic discount factors that, you know, that, um, uh, uh, that are motivated explicitly by private information, limited commitment, and incomplete markets. This, this is a literature that evolved you know, long before this crisis. It's a literature which has been on the radar screen for actually quite some time. I'm thinking of research here by, by Lutmer, Hay and Modest, Alvarez and Yearman, Lustig, Koch, Lakota, and Pistaferi. Now, the, cha the empirical challenge of this literature, to, in order to link to microeconomic micro evidence, is that the equilibrium implications of these models often feature tail properties of the distributions as they evolve over time. Um, these distributions are, it's, it's not obvious that they're very well measured in the context of standard microeconomic micro data sets. For instance, if you look at data like the uh, um, uh, often used, uh, the survey of consumer expenditures, um, and compare the growth rates uh, of consumption that come out of that to, to the national income and product accounts, you'll see very big discrepancies between the data sets. Um, that, so, so the extent to which, you, so even quality of the data here really becomes quite important if, 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 if as, as seems intriguing, we're going to be using these micro data sets to help us think more seriously about the, uh, these dynamic models. So on the one hand, the mere fact we're exploring these alternative market structures under which then, then um, distributions become important suggests that we, uh, micro -evidence, evidence should be used. It, there's some non-trivial challenges in doing precisely that. Moreover, as we confront microeconomic evidence, building in explicit heterogeneity and things like beliefs, preferences, and uh, technology kind of uh, becomes an inevitable push. And of course, this adds uh, all the more to the identification challenges facing econometricians. So I think this is a, a potentially fertile way to go. I think it's also relevant for this literature, uh, which I view as very close um, to, uh, uh, to some of the papers I'm talking about on agent-based simulation, that to the extent that's going to confront microeconomic evidence, these same type of challenges and issues are, 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 are going to come into play. So let me talk a little bit about beliefs in, uh, in my remaining time and kind of rational expectations. So much has been said about the limits of the rational expectations paradigm, but let's think about its virtues for a moment. The rational expectations paradigm conveniently removed belief specification as a freely imposed input in model building. And I think this was uh, um, certainly a productive thing to be doing. Moreover, it, it, it provided an approach to policy analysis that allowed for comparison across dynamic equilibria. It was, it was meant to deliver on econometric model challenging you know, of raised by Marshak and Hurwitz you know, decades ago. There's a direct extensions of it to learning about where learning is here within the context of an equilibrium. <clears throat> so if we're going to talk about extensions and replacements of this, we also ought to be thinking about, well, can we do this in ways that will also uh, continue to provide usable approaches for policy analysis? Now, I'm certainly sympathetic towards pushing beyond the rational expectations paradigm. I think it is very limiting, and I think it's, it's, it's uh, constructive to explore alternatives. I think as we do this, to my mind, we, we, have, we have to confront four related questions. So, and, and, and these are kind of econometric style questions. The first one is, when is learning about parameters or hidden states or the like difficult? When can economic agent struggles with forecasting the future have a big income on, on, on model outcomes? What are consequences when economic agents view their models as simplified approximations? And this has, you know, the, uh, and this has kind of in a dynamic learning context two, uh, uh, two different perspectives. If I'm, sitting about, if I'm thinking about an economic agent looking at, at, at historical data, that's kind of a backwards looking type calculation. What models do I use in order to process that, that, uh, that data looking backwards? But then I'm also a decision making looking forward, making a, and I need to make guesses about what's going to happen in the future, and, and, and concerns about my you know, model mis being misspecified or some simplification uh, can have important challenges for how I want to engage in, in, in kind of decision making. 
And then what is the scope for heterogeneity in beliefs to persist over long time horizons? So I think of the second, third, and fourth questions here as econometric challenges that, that, that we pass on from econometricians to individuals inside the models. And, um, and I think this is a very interesting avenue for future endeavor. Um, I think there's, the, there's uh, the scope for kind of belief heterogeneity being important for, uh, uh, and, and kind of belief fragility being important is, it seems connected to the notion that historical evidence uh, might be weak along some very important dimensions. So when things are very hard to learn about, if, if people have different, differing beliefs, then it's very easy to imagine those beliefs will persist over time and can have really important consequences in, uh, in the models we build. Um, when, when historical evidence is very weak, uh, the possibility of kind of priors, distortions, and other stuff persisting and, uh, 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 and having uh, you know, big impacts in decision making also be uh, becomes very, um, very pronounced. So individuals, for instance, may solve model selection problems or, mo or model averaging in different ways. Um, skepticism about potential models can fluctuate over time, provide interesting contributions to learning dynamics. This notion that risk premia can fluctuate over business cycles can be translated into, might, might well instead be things like um, uncertainty premia or, 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 or struggles with uh, uh, which, which among alternative models are best fitting uh, uh, fluctuate over time. Best fitting models of the past may, may not or should not be fully embraced in projecting the future and uncertainty about the future. And so kind of this skepticism can translate potentially into interesting questions about um, uh, 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 interesting implications for actions of economic agents, investors, and the like inside our models. So if, so if we believe that pr you know, projecting future macroeconomic growth rates might be important in terms of making decisions, then, then projecting things into the future is something that can be in, um, incredibly challenging. There might be scope for lots of diversity in terms of beliefs about. And, and it's then fruitful to try to incorporate these uh, within the context of our economic models. So again, this is like uh, um, using statistical tools and econometric tools to actually think about how, how to capture dynamic learning models. Of course, challenges like these can push us outside the formal rational expectation framework, but in ways that the richness of the data or weakness of the data remains informative to model builders. There's a variety of interesting attempts in the literature. I, um, I, I give here um, some general discussions by myself and, uh, one, of my, uh, um, and one of my co-authors, but there's other interesting work as well. There's been even uh, extensive literatures in decision theory trying to uh, um, provide underpinnings for some of the discussions we've talked about before, the Keynes, Hayek, and Knight distinctions of uncertainty and risk. Um, and there's been uh, attempts at trying to look at quantitative implications of some of these distinctions. So anyway, I think of this kind of uh, uh, certainly beliefs and heterogeneity and struggles to be uh, an important avenue of future research uh, and, and ones in which I think can be, uh, ones in which I personally believe will be very promising. So finally, in terms of concluding here, let me kind of point out the following, let me just kind of um, explore the following. Uh, certainly in the last few years, we've received some new evidence. This new evidence is going to uh, make us think differently about models going forward. It's going to make people inside our models think differently uh, going forward. I think finance and um, macro linkages, uh, which have been separated in the past, are going to become all the more uh, link going forward as a, as a consequence. It's only going to be the case that no longer is, uh, are, can people credibly argue macroeconomics is a solved problem. And uh, our fascination with the great moderation is in macroeconomics is, is uh, presumably behind us. But on the other hand, some of the issues in which, you know, the, you know, the new modeling insights is, um, which we've been discussing in the last couple of days, some of these insights have already been explored in the past and, and, and it should be possible to build on some of the uh, uh, of, 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 of research which has been done in the past in ways that can be very constructive. Thank you. There should be time for a short question if anybody wants to. Yes, please.
I'm certainly aware and fascinated by that literature. <laughs> that was a clear answer. Anyone else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sorry? Nope. So now we're talking, uh, are we talking about my own private research uh, one or the one that's uh, uh, sh showed up within macroeconomics and the like? Um, I certainly believe that, you know, this is uh, uh, in let's let all flowers bloom. I certainly think that we need to explore various different models of sources of fluctuations. I think the uh, pure technology shock model of fluctuations was a very, very limiting one and one that's already kind of had its life. Um, so I'm happy to, uh, if I look at the recent crisis, it seems to me like the, uh, uh, the challenges which we want to be looking at there are how do we look at financial market frictions and, uh, and, and have them interact. Uh, and have them interact with the uh, remaining macro uh, economic model in very interesting ways. And there's a variety of literature which is uh, pushing that direction. So that's the stuff that I'm personally very fascinated by, but I certainly think other, trying to understand better other sources of macroeconomic fluctuations is an interesting thing to do. So. Roman? Okay. Um, I'm not sure I can give a one minute or two minute answer to this. Uh, I think that calibration, as I tried to argue, the, uh, as uh, calibration, the verification, as was initially practiced with a so called real, real business cycle model, was um, a, an approach that had weak, very weak methodological defenses. It actually looked at, it, it, it looked at challenges that were arguably very weak. Uh, it didn't, it, there was no, it was kind of evident at the outset that uh, transient dynamics were not going to be fit and the like. So I'm all in favor of looking much more systematically at time series uh, evidence for, uh, 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 for trying to understand models. So I'm completely on board in terms of doing that. Um, am I worried about things like, um, I'm very concerned, I, I think it's a very fascinating question about um, what happens when we, we as econometricians use simplified and stylized models, which we inevitably do to capture very complicated phenomenon, and what the right way to proceed there, I think remains a very open but important question. And I think that's a question which is not only relevant to us as econometricians, but it's also relevant to how we think about ages inside our model, as, is, as you know from your own work. So I'm, I, that's an area that I find pers personally very fascinating and very important going forward. So I'm sure I'm answered about a tenth of your question, but. Yeah. One more question, short one, because we have time. So, you know, there's this, how macroeconomics has managed to miss the sort of credibility revolution that's taken over econometrics in like labor, development, health, and that really sort of the search for identification and natural experiments has sort of, you know, changed all these other fields, but yet macro sort of remains the sort of outlier in its entire empirical approach. Um, you know, it's been a very controversial notion that we should engage in social experiments to understand better the macro economy. Um, 
Uh, although perhaps macro policymakers have been doing this inadvertently, but it's, it's, a, it's a rather costly set of experiments to imagine. So yes, we should learn as much as we can from existing macro policy. Uh, I do think that this is a case where economic theorizing in conjunction with empirical evidence is the, uh, is the best and most fruitful way to go.